Hey, welcome back. Today we're going to be talking about how to solve physics problems dealing with rolling with slipping. So normally we see problems for AP Physics E Mechanics or maybe even AP 1 where the problem says there's rolling without slipping. What do you do when you see a problem that says rolling with slipping? So that's what we're going to be talking about today. And actually this lesson is appropriate for high school students as well who are just taking regular physics. There's no calculus here, so it's possible that you could be seeing this in just a high school physics class. So let's get to it. First of all, these equations on the left side apply when there is rolling without slipping. Those are true statements. And on the right side, they are no longer true. If you have slipping, then these relationships between essentially linear variables like this one right here and rotational variables like this one right here does not hold true if there is slipping going on. All right, so let's see how to work out a problem that has something like that in a slightly different style. Okay, and so let's take a look at this problem here. So the problem says an object is spinning at angular speed omega is then dropped on a horizontal surface. It begins rolling with slipping. At what time does the object stop slipping? So in effect, this is like your initial position. This is your final position. We're really concerned with this final position at the moment when it hits the surface and is sliding initially, but it will eventually catch and roll without slipping. Okay, so let's think about what the big picture is, and then I will explain it as we go through. The big picture answer is, we could say the time when V is equal to R times omega. That's the time that we want. So the big idea is we got to set this up in such a way that our given values and variables can substitute in and we can start to think about what we have to work with and set this up so that V is equal to R times omega. All right couple things to talk about. One is, at first glance, we don't have a lot to work with in terms of ideas. So when in doubt, I always tell my students to work with the sum of the forces strategy in the X and the Y, bring it together with friction. And in this case, we have rotation as well. So I'm going to talk you through all of that. You're going to say the sum of the forces in the X, and then just add up the forces in the X. What forces do we have? Well, it's just the force due to friction, right? Second line for the sum of the forces strategy, we just say is equal to mass times acceleration that axis. And then at this point, we want to ask ourselves, is this acceleration something or nothing? And so we say, is that acceleration something or nothing? In this case, it's something. So we're going to leave it there. If it was nothing, we would just get rid of it. So we can say the force due to friction is equal to mass times acceleration the x. And what do we know about the force due to friction? Well, we know the force due to friction, we can write it in a couple different ways, but we're gonna say it's mu times Fn. And that leads us to think, oh, we need to do something the y-axis, right? So let's do the same strategy for the y-axis. We say the sum of the forces in the y and think about the forces in the y-axis. So we've got a positive Fn plus a negative Fg. I write plus negative here because again, we're using the strategy of summing up the forces in that axis, in that y axis. And then we wanna again ask ourselves, is this something or nothing? Meaning this acceleration of the y. And again, we're thinking about this final position over here when it's in contact with the tabletop. So what do you think? Is that acceleration something or nothing? Well, that acceleration at that point is nothing. That's a zero, meaning we can cancel this out, set these equal to each other. What does that mean? Well, that means Fn minus Fg is equal to zero. So therefore, Fn is equal to Fg. And what does that mean? Well, Fn is equal to Mg. That's what it means. Okay, so that's something that we'll need. We, in fact, can go ahead and use that immediately and start to think about how to incorporate the x and the y in terms of friction. We can say the force due to friction. Oh, let's label this as the force due to friction that needs to go in here. So we could say that's going to be m times acceleration the x is equal to mu mg. Okay, so that's helpful and it's something but we're not quite there yet. We'll get there, we'll get to where we need to be. Let's use a similar strategy for the sum of the torques strategy. Let's think about the torques, and we would say the sum of the torques is equal to, and then literally just sum up the torques. So here's the question I have, out of these three forces here, which of the three, if any, is providing a torque? 
Well, the answer is only the force due to friction. The reason for that is the normal force is pointing in the same direction as that radius. So it's like the sine of zero, effectively, you could say. So that ends up being zero. And the force due to gravity is applied right at the axis of rotation. You could also call it the pivot point. So its R value is effectively zero. So that applies no torque. And the last one is the force due to friction. That does apply to a torque. So we're going to say this is the torque from friction. Second line for the sum of the torque strategy is the rotational version of Newton's second law, I times alpha. Then we set these equal to each other, and you could say torque from friction is equal to I times alpha. And then let's clarify torque from friction. We know that is the radius times the force due to friction is equal to I times alpha. And we know something about this force due to friction. We just said uh, this force due to friction is equal to mu mg. This is another way of looking at it, right? This is an m in case you can't read that. So we're going to put that in as mu mg is going to be this force due to friction is going to be equal to i times alpha. Now we're still a bit stuck here, but again we want to remind ourselves, well this is our master equation right here so to speak, so we want to think in terms of what can we solve for, and notice we have acceleration in a couple different ways, and what we want to do is use our equations. So there are a couple different ways of doing this, but I'm just going to grab the equations that we have available to us. Okay, and so these are the kinematic equations that we have available to us. Notice we have our linear equations out of these three. We do want to use this one over here and just sub this in. Take this and sub it in for this value up here and see what happens or this variable up here. And we're going to do something similar because we do have all of those other variables. We're going to take this and sub it in up here and see what happens. So that's the big picture of what we're doing. But before we do that, it makes sense though that we could solve for our accelerations. In other words, if you take a look at what we've done so far, we have this equation. Let's solve for our acceleration, the x. We could call that mu mg over m. We'll notice the m's cancel. And so we could say our acceleration, the x, is equal to mu g. Okay, so that's important. We can sub that in into the equation when we get there. And then notice on the right side, we still have r mu mg. We could say is over i is equal to alpha. So again, I'm solving for angular acceleration in this case. Now we can start to plug into our master equation. So I'm going to go about using a different color here so you can see what I'm talking about. So again, we can just say the time that we need is when this relationship holds true, right? So let's sub in, I could label this as like equation one over here. So let's sub in equation one and see what happens. So that's our V naught plus acceleration the X times time is equal to R times and for omega, we've got omega naught plus acceleration times time. Okay, so all I've done is substituted in those two equations for this relationship with some background work. The background work is up there in white. And let's think about some of the things that we know. Notice, what do you notice that's zero? Anything that's zero here, it's a useful thing to think about. Well, our initial velocity is actually gonna be zero. This thing goes away, that simplifies the problem. We might as well distribute the r as well so that we keep track of everything that we're doing. So it's a sub x t is equal to r omega naught plus r alpha t. Okay, now we've got some things for acceleration that we had solved for, right? Like we've already got this that we can plug in here and this angular acceleration can go here. And I am running out of room, so I'm gonna move this down and give it a shot. So that is mu g t is equal to r omega naught plus r and our alpha. Let's put in what our alpha is. That's gonna be r mu m g over i, and that is gonna be times t. Now, at this point, I do wanna talk about direction here. Remember, we said that if you have something like this set up, we could say if we have a counterclockwise rotation, that's gonna be considered to be positive. 
If we have a clockwise rotation, that's considered to be negative typically. And if you think about what we have initially, we have omega initial is equal to a negative value. So I'm gonna make that a negative value and we wanna do this just once. We wanna do this once early on in the problem. So I'm gonna go back and make this negative here, like right here, and then we can pull out the negative in this term right here. So that's important to keep track of. Respectfully, I've seen the College Board video on this. I like the reasoning, but I would apply the negative to the initial angular velocity here. I think it makes more sense to do that. It is true that the angular acceleration is going to be the opposite direction of that. In any case, the algebra is getting a bit tricky or ugly or beautiful, depending on your perspective, I suppose. We can just apply this in here and start to think about how we can isolate for t. So we can say mu g t is equal to minus r omega naught plus r squared mu m g t over i. So let's think about where our equations are that variable of t r. We can take this term right here and just move it over to this side so we can say mu g t minus r squared mu m g t over i is equal to negative r omega naught here we want to get t by itself right so i'm again running out of room so maybe i'll work over here so i could say t is equal to mu g minus r squared u m g over i and that is equal to minus r omega naught and so if we isolate for t we could say this is true r omega naught over mu g minus r squared mu mg over i. So if we wanted to leave it there, we could. If we wanted to clean that up a little bit, we could. I'm not motivated to clean it up at this point. I don't want to get too lost in the weeds with the algebra. It's really the big idea that I want you to get here as to how we got to this stage, how we were able to do this. And again, I get a slightly different answer than the video from AP Classroom, but I'm making this as a different assumption, and I think my assumption is correct. The initial angular speed, we should be treating it as negative, and that angular acceleration, therefore, should be treated as positive, in my opinion, which is why I get a slightly different answer from the College Board. I guess I could say that I could see that the author is trying to avoid getting a negative with time, which doesn't make sense. I would agree it doesn't make sense. We don't have numbers to plug into this equation to see if we end up with an overall negative value for time. If that were the case, I would be in favor of changing everything in terms of our assumptions of what is positive and negative, just to make sure that the time comes out to be positive, because we do need to have a time that's positive, of course. In any case, Hopefully that was helpful. I've gone over an entire year of physics as well as most of the concepts for AP Physics E mechanics in video format on YouTube. If you have any questions or comments down below, please let me know. And I hope you all have a great day. Take care.